um, I wanted you to go to slide number six, um, the first uh, picture slide, if you could, um, and truly to say that children with juvenile dermatomyositis um, are, are the primary group that I'm going to be talking about today. Juvenile dermatomyositis is the primary form of myositis that children do get, even though there's other forms of it, and some of this is applicable to those as well. If you move to the next slide, slide number seven, that these children have some very classic rashes that we describe that are features that we can see that make us concerned about or are actually diagnostic of juvenile dermatomyositis. And if you move on to um, slide number eight, this is showing you a picture of all the manifestations, all the possible features that children could have um, when they present and during the course of their, um, their condition uh, as it goes on. And really, there's multiple areas that we can see. Some children will have fevers and just feel very exhausted and tired. It can be some lung problems, like with weakness of the muscles of the lungs and other features such as difficulty with breathing or when trying to have some, a child talk, sometimes it's difficult for them to get all their words out or their voice changes and it's more high-pitched. And much of that is related to weakness of the muscles in those areas. You can also have involvement of your GI tract where you have difficulty swallowing and can even have pain in your GI tract due to inflammation and sometimes blood vessel inflammation or what we call vasculitis. And then there's other features such as uh, more commonly, you know, weakness of their muscles. Muscles can ache. But you can also get things like arthritis. Uh, so we shouldn't be fooled if arthritis is present and we think there's myositis because that can happen along with the, the muscle inflammation. And then other features such as calcifications or hard nodules under the skin, something called Raynaud's, which is actually when the blood vessels tighten up in like the hands and the feet and there's color changes in those areas. And then there's a whole slew of skin findings that we um, can find. And I'm going to show you a couple more pictures of that, such as something we commonly call Gotrin's rash, which is that red rash that can have bumps over your, your hands, your knuckles, sometimes elbows, knees. Um, you can get a red purplish rash around your eyelids. And then there's also um, swelling that can occur around your nail beds in your hand, where often rheumatologists are looking at the nail beds to see if you see these blood vessels that are swollen um, and not organized in the way that we should, um, we think we should see it. And then you get redness on your face, around your neck, sores in your mouth. You can actually get small ulcers in some, in some children. And so there's a whole group of features, as, as I say, that, that children can have, and it really varies to the individual child. Um, so not every child is alike. So if I go, go to the next slide, uh, slide number nine, this is showing you some classic facial rash that you'd see in a child where you get redness around the cheeks, around the nose, and, and often it spares the area right around the lips. Um, it's something that we feel is pretty classic. Also, which I hope you can appreciate this young child, she has a lot of swelling around her ears as well, another area. Move to the next slide, please. This is showing you from the side another child who has a similar kind of redness. You can also see it over her eyelids, but also the redness around her ears and sometimes even behind her ears. Go to the next one, please. Redness and this Gotrin's rash on the hand showing you that there's redness noted over those knuckles and over those fing finger joints as well. Next picture, please. Um, where you actually see that, um, that when I was talking to you about uh, changes around the nail beds, there's some redness there, and you can almost see the blood vessels kind of popping out at you as you, as you look at those pictures. And then the next picture kind of shows you something a little more up close with it. And then go to the next one, which is the teeth pictures. This is showing you something very similar can happen in the gums in the mouth. And often parents, when this occurs, will say, my child's gums bleed, and people think it's because they've got um, something wrong with their, you know, their dentition, and actually it's because of this vascular inflammation. Follow the next one, please. So this sort of rounds out at least what I can show you pictorially, um, a lot of the features, especially the skin type of features that children with dermatomyositis can have. Now go to the next one, please. Um, this is showing you characteristics of children with dermatomyositis. So the, the middle column is comparing children with um, the adults which are on the right. 
With dermatomyositis, it happens in adults, yet we really believe, even though there's some overlapping features, there are different diseases. And I just want to highlight a couple components here. If I come down, some of the things that happen in children that don't happen in adults is children are more often um, susceptible to getting calcinosis or calcium under the skin. In addition, what children don't get, which is a good thing, is we don't think malignancy is related to getting dermatomyositis. And if you read about it in adults, you'll hear about that. And I just want to make a point to say we don't believe that occurs in children. Also, children don't get as much lung disease that's in the lungs. I talked to you about muscle weakness around the lungs where, you know, their cough is weaker, their voice can be weaker, and sometimes it's, their breath isn't quite as strong. Yet they all less often actually get inflammation in the lung tissue, which is also a very good thing. And children don't die from this disease like adults can. And that, I just want to make sure I point that out in case you're reading any literature and it's focusing more on adults that that's a big difference. So let's go to the next slide, which is slide 20. So who gets this condition? Um, we think it's about one in 200 to 100,000 individuals. So it's considered a very rare disease. Uh, we do know and we do believe it's a higher incidence in many in darker skinned individuals and also in areas geographically that are getting more sunlight, potentially closer to the equator, um, because sun exposure is one of the factors that we feel that is related to the, um, potentially related to the onset of the disease. So next slide. So what are the criteria? Why do you think my child has this? Well, one is what are the classic findings that we're looking for for diagnosis? Um, the skin um, findings are on the right side, so the things I just talked to you about. The last one that's um, emphasized is that nail bed, right on the nails, that inflammation that we see with those blood vessels that look swollen. And then on the left side are the muscle findings. So this is a condition where you get symmetrical disease. It's both sides. And it's, it's the muscles closer to the trunk of the body. So some of the first muscles that are weak are around your neck and your belly, which are really hard to know they're weak unless somebody's falling or it's difficult to get up um, in, a, you know, in a sitted or laying down position. Uh, we don't understand why it's like that, why it starts with those muscles closer to the body, um, but that's a feature of this. We also get elevation of muscle enzymes. So as the muscles are involved or inflamed, they leak enzymes out of them and the elevation can occur. Um, and then we also, the other, other findings that um, for diagnosis are something called an EMG. And that's a test that goes in and looks at the way the muscles and nerves are working. It is less often done. Um, the next two things are done much more often today, but it's still part of the potential diagnosis of if your physician has chosen to do that. Um, muscle biopsy, where they actually look at the muscle that they think is involved and look for inflammation, um, is one of the criteria. And then MRI. So the use of MRI now um, has been added into these criteria where we see a very specific edema in the muscle or swelling in the muscle that we think is inflammation. It's not 100% specific for myositis, but it is, it is one of the um, criteria that we use. So your physicians might have done some of these tests to help with the diagnosis. The next, next slide, please, talks about other diagnostic studies. So we talked about muscle enzymes. Now, there's multiple muscle enzymes um, that we can occur, and I've listed a few of them here. Most commonly, you hear about CK, but it's important to do the other muscle enzymes because sometimes CK is normal. Uh, in children, and particularly if we think the inflammation's been going on for a while. Other things that will get done are like markers of inflammation, like an ESR or sedimentation rate. It's not normal, it's not abnormal in a lot of people, so it's not very helpful in the diagnosis. So often people don't do it. Um, and ANA is one of the antibody screening tests that we sometimes do. Um, it is positive in patients, but where it helps us is to make sure that there's not an overlapping condition, because sometimes it'll suggest that maybe the, what we're seeing is overlapping with some other autoimmune disease. And then the other classic autoimmune tests, like rheumatoid factor and DNA, um, and the ones that say ENA, they're not positive very often, and I don't expect them to be. So that is something that um, most of the time don't need to happen, don't need to be obtained, but if they are and they're positive, I wouldn't be shocked, but they're not something that we routinely um, consider positive in the disease. 
Now, there are other antibody tests now, and that Joe one at the bottom is one of those tests. There's a whole panel of antibodies now that we do recommend people have, and they're called myositis antibodies, and Joe one is just a representation of one of those antibodies. And why we think it's important is we actually think it helps us kind of classify or subclassify the condition in people and maybe helps us predict a little bit about what to look out for, like Joe one if it's positive, you could have more lung fibrosis, and so it's something we want to look, look for, right? Um, and we want to follow a lot more closely. There's other antibodies that might suggest that you're at more risk of getting calcium deposition. So we want to be able to pay attention to that and potentially address our therapies to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, the next, um, next uh, slide, please, talks about the abnormal testing. I've mentioned these um, um, in the previous slide. I just want to point out they're not always abnormal in everybody. There's a few percent of people in all of these tests where things look normal. So that's where I think the physician has to have a high degree of suspicion. And if we still think it's that, you know, keep looking for it. And those just don't settle on I don't know, but really look at it so we can help make a for sure diagnosis. Next slide. This slide really um, kind of starts starts addressing and talking about all the different antibodies. I mentioned that in a couple slides ago, but there's many, many antibodies that we could potentially see in, in juvenile myositis. And, and what we think is that based on these antibodies, you can have different features. So like one group of, of individuals could have lung disease, they're much more likely to have these antibodies. So these antibodies are helpful to us with knowing potentially what to, what to do. There's some antibodies that you see that some have, have some overlapping symptoms. So if you see one of these, sometimes you're looking out for other types of autoimmune disease that can be seen with dermatomyositis. And so we do believe that they're very, very helpful. And then I just want to follow with the last slide and really just mention that there has been a huge amount of work that's been done, to, and this is in the community of people around the world who take care of children with myositis, to come up with what we think are really some standardizations around treatment to say, if your child has this form of dermatomyositis, we really believe here's a group of medicines that we believe you should be using. And what this does is help those that maybe aren't thinking about it every day, like we are, um, what people recommend. It also helps us have a little more uniformity to it so that when we're trying to compare different um, institutions or if we're trying to study it, we can compare them and actually make really good decisions on one maybe is better than another, or one has more side effects or less side effects than another. And so the first-line therapies are still thought to be steroids, usually oral steroids, but IV can be added to it, um, in addition to methotrexate. Um, in the U.S. and even in studies in Europe, it is found to be better than using steroids alone and has much less side effects than using some of the other medicines that sometimes are started, like cyclosporin. Now, some people believe we should add IVIG into this first-line therapy, and most people believe they add it when somebody is a little sicker. When they're having a few more problems, they'll add it, and they'll definitely consider it if somebody over the first month or so of treatment is not getting better in the way that they feel they should. But then we have second-line therapies that where IVIG is in that therapy, but there's also other medicines like rituximab, um, which is an IV medicine, cyclosporin, which is oral, azathioprine, which is imuran, tacrolimus, and CELSEP, or mycophenolate mofetil, are thought to be second-line agents. And then if patients are continuing to be ill or have very specific findings or problems, we sometimes will go to other agents such as cyclophosphamide, and there have been a few children in the world that have had bone marrow transplants for the disease, even though that's incredibly rare, particularly now with all the medications we use. On the top of that is all patients should be having sunscreen and sun avoidance. Some patients will get plaquenil or hydroxychloroquine added, um, particularly if they're very sun sensitive. And then we do recommend calcium and vitamin D because most people in the United States are vitamin D. They have low vitamin D levels just because of our exposure. 